So Joe Danny is joining us. Joe, do you want to just kind of introduce yourself a little bit? I understand you're the chief marketing officer for Nighthash. But what does that yeah, kind of right, um... what does that kind of involve, and what's your kind of background? What do you kind of uh, bring to that? Yes, I'm the head of marketing and PR at uh, Nicehash. Um, been interested in cryptocurrency for a long time. Um, been working in different fields before uh, in IT. Um, and got into cryptocurrency. It's just really fascinating about the different use cases for uh, blockchain technology. I find it's really quite exciting. It's quite interesting compared to what the beginning of the internet uh, was. It's kind of this kind of atmosphere in, in the industry. Sure. So you say it's where startups are now. You've, it's, you've having the feeling of the startup culture again within within cryptocurrency. Is is that what 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 the feeling is within crypto at the moment, or is it slightly more more mature than that? No, it's a little more mature than that. But there's definitely a lot of. Um, it's still very much at the beginning. Um, I think it's very much the beginning of the technology. I think it's not been fully uh, exploited yet, fully developed yet. Um, but we're seeing so many interesting projects. Uh, coming up every day and different different platforms trying to solve different problems using this this technology uh, with a lot of interesting use cases okay i want to follow up on that in just a moment because you you spoke about the sort of different uses of blockchain and different projects um could you just talk to us a little bit about nice hash this is um from from what i've seen on your website kind of a, a quite a new crypto exchange could you talk a little bit about about where you guys are and, and where you're heading yeah, absolutely. So NiceHash has actually um, been around since 2014, okay. and we're a hash power broker. So it's quite a unique um, position in the crypto market, if you like, in the sense that we buy and sell computing power for uh, mining. So people can, for example, a user on one side, perhaps has a, a gaming PC, and they have a good graphics card, they can connect up to NiceHash and then sell their computing power which then gets forwarded on to the buyers of HashPower, uh, who will then connect to their mining pool and they will mine a cryptocurrency using that computer power. So we're basically uh, an open exchange where we connect uh, the buyers and sellers for mining cryptocurrencies. And then we also have uh, an exchange so that the miners, uh, they all get paid in Bitcoin, regardless of whichever coin they're mining. And uh, from this, they can then exchange to other currencies if they want, like Ethereum or uh, chilies or any of anything like this okay uh, i don't know about so uh, your stuart and his knowledge i'm going to, have to roll back a little bit and just kind of um what we talk about mining and you say that people can kind of you're you're connecting um the buyers and, and the miners to, to use their computer power what what does that involve what what is kind of mining a cryptocurrency just for the the real basic side of things yeah, so mining a cryptocurrency, a cryptocurrency, and I'll just start from, from the, the beginning. So yeah, cryptocurrency please. is a generally decentralized uh, form of currency, which is on a digital ledger or a blockchain. Um, so that means it's in general, they're not controlled by any one entity. They're, they're simply uh, validated uh, by the miners um, around the world who are connecting up their computer power. And what they're doing by actually mining is uh, they're solving very complex mathematical um, problems, if you like. Uh, it's called hashing. So they are solving the hashes in order to, to get reward for the block. So when someone sends uh, cryptocurrency from one person to another, this is uh, included in a block. And then that block gets verified by the miners uh, to prove its authenticity, that it's the, the true um, transaction. So there can be no double spending or or cheating or anything like this or, or fraud. So the miners are really there to protect the network, to verify the network and to validate the, the transactions. So essentially replacing what um, what a bank or a visa would do uh, in this sense, if you compare it to a traditional model. Again, this, uh, so the, the miners, it's still, it's an automated process. So your, your customers or the people you are facilitating to use their processing power, they don't actually do anything, it's just, leave it turned on in a corner of the room essentially yes essentially yeah yeah uh, if you're yeah if you just connect up your computer you would download uh, the nice hash software and this will connect your uh, gpu or your graphics card up mm -hmm. and, and from this your gpu will then work on hashing the, the algorithms so it will then forward that power to the to the pools 
And is it, so it's uh, basically it's like a one click. Uh, you just download, press play, and then your computer is mining. And is this uh, is this something anyone? Can use quite a lot of resources. Okay, so is it something anyone could do, or you know, if I'm, I'm thinking um, I've got yeah, my computer yeah. here, if I'm when I'm not using it, could I connect nice hash and kind of leave it earning me money almost? Um, yeah, if you have the right uh, hardware, you can. Um, there's right. a lot of different. It's not really recommended on laptops uh, because they're not really designed for processing. Uh, high quality graphics or things like this. But anything, uh, any decent computer that has a, a graphics card, um, you can so also I'm do actually... it on a C CPU as well. Okay. Yeah, so I was gonna ask you maybe, once we finish the, the recording, Job, I'm, I'm doing one on my mobile phone actually. So from what, what you've just said about it not being suitable to laptops, my mobile phone one is called B Network. I assume that's a very tiny little, little, little subset of the industry. There's not gonna be much, much mining process. My once a day tapping the B is, is doing doing to help. Yeah, there are some solutions for doing it uh, this way as well. Um, they, yeah, they tend to be a, a lot smaller because the, um, the profitability is much less because they simply don't have the processing power to, to do more from it. Um, and there's some other interesting things like, um, uh, what's that called? Uh, helium, for example. So there's, there's other ways of mining doing different mm -hmm. things. Um, but what NiceHash focuses on is really like the computer power yeah, because this is where we get the most hash rate from and it's uh, much more profitable for, for someone to use it this way. Okay, so that, that's all really interesting. Certainly sort of a side of cryptocurrency I had no idea of. Uh, I, I'd heard much more about the investment side of it, you know, buying and selling Bitcoin or Ethereum or, or, or whatever it is. What's the kind of, can you talk a little bit now about the kind of current state of things on that side of it in, in terms of for the sort of investments, investors and traders? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the crypto industry, as we know, it's pe most people have heard of Bitcoin um, and Ethereum, I think. They're the two most well-known or the most talked about in the mainstream uh, media. Yeah. And Bitcoin is kind of really the first um, major cryptocurrency. There was a few ex experiments before it. Uh, but Bitcoin was the first one that was really successful and took off. And to date, it's still the most successful one, um, this, despite all the other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum um, trying to solve other issues. It's still the most, uh, the biggest one and the most popular one. But you've got uh, Ethereum tried to basically build on what um, Bitcoin started with by adding a smart contract functionality to it. And many other projects have now followed suit and are doing the same uh, the same thing. They're trying to solve the the flaws which Bitcoin has, which is essentially speed and scalability, the two of the big ones, um, because it can only process so many transactions uh, per block. So if you're comparing it to the traditional uh, Visa, for example, it's much much uh, slower per uh, per transaction as you're sending, and you cannot uh, build so many things upon it. Whereas with Ethereum, you can build into it smart contracts. So you can you can put a contract up there, which is on the blockchain, and anything that's on the blockchain is uh, immutable, so it cannot be changed. So it's a very good way to to do some kind of uh, loan contract or uh, even to transfer an asset, like uh, to sell a deed for a house, for example. If it's on the blockchain, it's concrete; it's like it cannot be cannot be modified. So there are many many ways that you can build upon it, and that's what we're seeing at the moment: is more projects trying to um, to solve the, um, the issues, if you like, of doing more things with the technology. So we have currencies, which, which work. Uh, then we have places which are trying to do smart uh, contracts, places which are more focused on asset transfer. And, and so for example, the, the sport tokens is another, uh, NFTs is another feature of this, but that kind of comes under asset transfer. So what, what we're really seeing is people trying to um, to solve the scalability and the speed. This is the main uh, the main thing people are working on at the moment, I would say. So that would be the biggest issue for those working and, and trading in cryptocurrency. It's, it's it's scaling up, would you say? Or is it choosing which projects suit uh, joining a blockchain and which should more traditional payment methods should be used? Would you say they're the top two issues or? Yeah, so for from an investing point of view, it's more about uh, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of things happening in crypto. There's a lot of uh, projects which, you know, boom for a very short time and then fail. There's a lot of ups and downs with it. It's very, very volatile. Um, and we see that with even with Bitcoin, its price goes up and down and it's influenced by many factors. 
So when you're when you're looking at um, investing, you're you're looking at what the project is doing and what's what's its long term potential. Um, if you're looking at it from a from an investment point of view, which a lot of people right now are kind of speculating and um, almost betting on which which project is going to be the one that that makes it, you know, that solves the, mm -hmm. the thing and becomes the the biggest one. Um, so there's a lot of room for for that. Yes, I guess that's why it's come into our our radar for our purpose of our, our podcast was with the issues of <clears throat> socios and their fan tokens, how they are the shirt sponsors, so the on jersey sponsors of Valencia and Inter Milan, and they have a partnership with a lot of other other teams as well. So from how you've what you've summarized so far, the purpose of socios it is a regular cryptocurrency with the same issues and benefits as you've been describing but targeted at so my main question is so there's, there's the two shirt sponsors there's an inter milan socio fan token and a valencia one are they two different cryptocurrencies or are they the same socio cryptocurrency just with different brand names for the different teams as, as far as you're you're aware or as far as you would expect this to be yeah, so Socios is the main platform and, and the main uh, currency, if you like. Mm -hmm. And the tokens are basically built on top of this. So you have, yeah, then you can have many different tokens with different brands or names um, on top of this. So basically anyone can go onto the Socios network mm -hmm. and build upon it their own token. So for, for example, yeah, Manchester City or Valencia or, or any club like this, they can create their own token onto this. You know, will have its unique uh, unique properties, um, but it's built, all built on the same same project, same platform. Okay, so by is it a fan token? Oh, is it, is that the same thing as a cryptocurrency? So, is Manchester City fan token a cryptocurrency, or just based on the socio existing platform? Yeah, so it's, it's a cryptocurrency, and that's a currency. Okay, yeah, and, that, and that can be traded on exchanges. So if you um, if you go to some of the bigger cryptocurrency exchanges, you can see like Barcelona token, Valencia token, this, uh, and they can all be traded uh, separately mm -hmm. because they are they fluctuate in value based on um, different things. But based on, uh, mm -hmm. for example, what's happening at the club, um, a good example of this was with uh, when Messi just moved to PSG. Mm -hmm. We saw the fan token for PSG skyrocket uh, based on the news that Messi was coming. So things, I think he was, um, he was like this paid in, in a fan token as well, actually. I think as part of his signing on fee, I don't know what percentage, but whether it was just a symbolic one or whether it was a significant amount, but he did get some fan tokens as part of his signing on fee. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think they haven't released the exact percentage, but I think right. it was quite a lot. <laughs> I've, I've seen quoted in the media a large amount of the, the PSG fan token, which is on the, the, the Socios platform, which, yeah. So it's, it's curious to see how they, they fluctuate. Also on the results of matches, we saw towards the end of the Champions League last season, the Manchester City one kind of took a bit of a spike against uh, some of the other clubs because they were favourites to win the Champions League. Um, so that's quite interesting. So we kind of, and it was a good question from Stuart because like, for the uninitiated like myself, yeah. it's sort of like, what's a cryptocurrency or what's a fan token? And I, so I think we've kind of seen that, that they're very similar, right? And, and like you said, they're built on the same kind of platform. So then the next step along from that, I think, is is what's an NFT? Because this has kind of been a big keyword, a big buzzword in, in the media lately. And again, I'm kind of like, I've just sort of managed to wrap my head around like how Bitcoin and Ethereum work more or less. And now I've got like fan tokens and NFTs to deal with. Um, so do you, could you sort of explain to us the, the kind of difference there again? Yeah, so with a, a fan token, it's like, um, yeah, so it's a cryptocurrency. So it's fungible in the sense that one has the same value as the other. So we can compare compare this to um, a euro or um, a, a British pound, if you like. Uh, so you give, I give you one pound and uh, you get one back. The value is the same. So they're, they're fungible. They're interchangeable. Whereas with an NFT, it's a non-fungible token. So these are not fungible. So everyone is unique. And it has a different uh, a different value. So in this sense, it's closer to uh, art, and that's why art has become so popular with NFTs, is because it follows very much the same kind of collector's uh, mindset, in the sense that there's only one Mona Lisa. There might be many copies of it, but the original 
there is only one and it's unique. So it's it would be an NFT if you like, it's a non-fungible item, a non-fungible token. Uh, so that's really the main difference between fungible and, and non-fungible. And NFTs have become huge in the last year, um, partly because of this uh, collector mindset. And it's basically an extension, a digital extension of, of the traditional collectors uh, field or industry, if you like, uh, in the sense that it's just an evolution of that. Um, it's kind of crazy how we see, you know, pictures, uh, a JPEG or a, a picture uh, sold for millions of dollars um, on the internet. So it's just a picture that you can still copy. You know, you can copy the picture itself and download it and, and look at it. But it's the, the same if you compare this to an art. You know, the first NFT I heard of was possibly a year ago was the first ever tweet from the founder of Twitter. That's the first that was bought for, I think it was at least $2 million. Maybe, you, you know, the exact figure that's where I first heard of it I, I couldn't initially work out why I guess whoever could spend two million dollars and what is essentially a a screenshot what they physically own is is, is a, a jpeg screenshot of this first tweet but what, what myself and Jamie have been looking into in a sporting point of view I can sort of um, see so we spoke with MotoGP earlier and they have their own nft trading cards so you mean by the unique so a trading card might be uh, Valentina Rossi's helmet. So, can, can you, if I'm not sure, can you kind of explain, Joe, how that's unique? So, how, why, how does the technology work, which means nobody else can own this Valentina Rossi helmet? Yeah. So the way it works is that well, on the blockchain, everything is timestamped. So okay. there's there's no denying who has the first the first one who has it. It's it's like there and cannot be changed. So if you uh, the NFT basically transfers the ownership. So, for example, the, the author of it would be the um, MotoGP. Mm -hmm. And they then transfer the ownership of that unique item, so his Valentino Rossi's helmet, to the person who buys it. And that ownership is then set in stone, if you like. It's, it's, nobody, can die that, nobody can deny that that person then owns it. And this is why NFTs have become very popular for you know, sports, uh, sports um, teams and and things like this in general so is it almost uh, because a... if you, you sell it on that the ownership then gets passed on on the blockchain to the next person so if you sell it to someone else so you're basically just buying the ownership okay so if, if i've bought this motor gp trading card and i sell it to jamie how do i use something like nice hash to register the change of nft ownership or is that back how does that specifically work Right. Yeah, for NFTs, it's uh, you would need to go to um, an NFT marketplace, okay. And this would depend where the NFT had been created. So different marketplaces are on different platforms. Um, mm -hmm. Ethereum is the biggest one at the moment. Okay. Uh, they have uh, OpenSea; it's the most famous um, marketplace. Mm -hmm. So it's something like a, you can think of it something like eBay, if you like, where you go and you find what you want to buy. Oh, okay, okay. And you can buy it there, and you can also a lot of them are on auction as well. So they're like auctioned items. So these things, as they're, they're unique one-offs, they, they can fluctuate in value as well. Is that, am I right in thinking that? Sort of from a perspective exactly, yeah. of someone that might buy, you know, okay, it's cool to say I own the digital rights to Valentino Rossi's helmet or whatever it, it, it may be. And I think, I think part of the problem is this idea of ownership. And, and, but, you know, I don't know, if something happens and Valentino Rossi helmet becomes more valuable than Mark Marquez helmet, for example, um, I could then sort of cash that in. And, and take a profit on that. Exactly. That's that's where NFTs are really popular and, and taking off a lot because people realize they can be they can be influenced by events. So for, for a sports team is a perfect example of this. You know, if um, let's say Man City or whatever wins the Champions League, if there was some unique NFT from that team, it would skyrocket in value because of the external event to to the team, to the to the NFT. So, and you could say the same for the, the motorbike helmets. If he, he wins all of the, the races, it's very likely that I, that token will, will rise in value. But for the purpose of, so for, again, to use the, the MotoGP example, so what? how does Moto, is this a almost a license to print money for at MotoGP? So they currently have a 2021 range of NFTs on their website. So in 2022 season, do they just say, yeah, we now have 2022 
versions of Valentina Rossi's helmet or Mar- Mark Marquez's bike. What actual work in the what are the production costs for MotoGP in creating these NFTs? Yeah, so when they when you produce an NFT, you pay a, a certain cost to to mint. It's called. So it's like mm-hmm. you can think of it as like uh, printing a currency. Okay. So you pay a certain fee to mint it. Um, and Ethereum has some issues with this because they have very high gas fees. They're called. It's basically transaction fees, and and they can get very very high because there's so much congestion on the network. Um, so that's one of the issues they have to to deal with. Um, and this kind of raises the value because you're then paying extra for the transaction fee as well as the item that you're buying. So that can sometimes get really ridiculous. Um, so that's that's one of the, the downsides to the NFTs. But from the team's perspective for the, the MotoGP who is creating this, they could create new series every year. Um, and then in 10 years time, you know, the first the first year series will probably be a lot more valuable than the most recent one, for example. And then again, yeah, this is probably touched on this slightly before, but so if MotoGP, they sell out of their fan tokens for 2021 season. And in 10 years time, that increased value, it goes to whoever bought the NFT. MotoGP don't get anything. They don't get a percentage cut of every time the NFT changes places. So once MotoGP sell it for the first time, that's it in terms of their their revenue. That actually depends how they set it up. Um, I think most sport teams or most, um, yeah, most platforms who are doing like a large number of them like this, they would just transfer the whole ownership where once it's sold. Uh, I mean, the whole ownership is is transferred, but sometimes you can add a royalty to it. So when you set up the um, NFT itself, uh, you can add a royalty. And this is something, for example, with uh, we see a lot with music and uh, people creating, because you can make anything into an NFT. It could be a music, it could be a video, it could be a, a could picture. Be a it could be a podcast, exactly. It could be, it could be almost anything that's digital. And so in this sense, uh, we see it a lot with uh, with music or even with paintings. So when it's when the item is resold, the original uh, creator gets a small percentage of what it was and they can choose what that what that percentage is when they make the NFT. That's really interesting. Okay. The other side of it, I want to just kind of ask a little bit about if uh, I, I, Surare, I think it's pronounced, is like the, the official NFT partners of La Liga, for example. Um, amongst other um, sports leagues, um, and they work with 180 clubs, which they they're continuously adding to, and they've kind of gamified it in the sense that you, so they've got the the players are the NFT almost, or like a player sticker or a player card, um, and they've made it so you can kind of build your your dream team through buying the NFTs, um, and like I, so for me that kind of adds another sense to, to, you know, maybe you buy, um, I don't know, Robert Lewandowski, for example, his NFT. And this year he's probably, you know, he's probably one of the better players in Europe or well, he is one of the best players in Europe. He's probably one of the best players on the planet. Um, and so like, obviously he'd be like a star player. I'd imagine higher value than, um, I don't know, Antoine Griezmann, for example. Um, but so for me, that kind of gamification adds an angle to it that that almost makes sense, but maybe that's because I'm not a collector. Like I've never really kind of bought things to collect. Um, but then it also makes sense that in, I don't know, five years from now, we might see the, the Lewandowski NFT go up against whoever the big star in five years is, uh, I don't know, Ansu Fati. And, and so for me to have the 2021, 22 Robert Lewandowski NFT card, and then to you know have the opportunity of kind of comparing that to the 25, 26 Ansu Fati, for example, um, that kind of is almost quite a good metaphor for how how these things could work in terms of value. And 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 I like that gamification angle. I'm not quite sure what I'm asking or what the question is, <laughs> um, but it's kind of an interesting, another interesting angle on on the whole thing. Um, I don't know if you're following any of the kind of more gamified versions of NFTs. Yeah, the, the gamification aspect of it is really interesting because it's um, yeah you can do it with so many things. You can do it with almost anything. You can gamify the the process of, of doing something. So then the collecting becomes a whole different a different thing. It's not even collecting anymore. It's it's like a game or speculating. Uh, we see it a lot with video games, of course. Uh, people, uh, video game makers, they are making uh, 
NFTs into it uh, directly into their platforms. So you, when you're in the game, you get and you can win an NFT or find one, things like this. Okay. And, and so this makes be it like really a unique, really interesting a unique for... item, sort of a weapon or exactly, yeah, yeah. And would you say? Yeah, you... Like... So with as Jamie was saying, so if somebody were to now buy a Robert Lewandowski NFT and sell it when it might double in value when he retires in two or three years time, do you see investments in NFTs and crypto again being considered as gambling in, in some ways by some regulators perhaps? Yeah, I think in, in some ways it's, it can be seen like this. Um, yeah, there's lots of different aspects to it, uh, to the investing side of, of crypto. With the NFTs at the moment, it is, it is very much like, like gambling because it's very, very loose in, in a sense. But we, we do start to see uh, regulations coming in for crypto, which I think is going to be beneficial in the, in the long term. Uh, because it's when you, when you start some, some new technology, there's no sort of uh, rules or, no. or it's, it's very difficult for people to invest a lot of money if you don't know what's going to happen to that. Uh, you know, if it gets completely banned or something, then you don't want to invest a lot of money into no. it. Uh, with crypto, we've seen it's, it's not the case. It's here to stay. It's become so big and there's so many companies involved in it. There's so much money into it. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of here to stay. But uh, for things like NFTs, that there's, there will probably come at some point some some rules for it, a little bit like we see with the uh, gambling. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think, I guess Stuart was kind of hinting at this with that question. You know, Bolton Wonders have ended the sort of any association with with gambling companies. And it looks like that there's going to be regulation put in place that, the, you know, sort of the traditional gambling companies can't be shirt sponsors or can't be, you know, sponsors of, of football teams. Um, and yet we're seeing lots of football teams, you know, Stuart mentioned, uh, but socios are the, the shirt sponsors of Valencia and they're, they're quite strong partners with a lot of, of big clubs and, and competitions. Um, and Sorare, as I just mentioned. So it's kind of like, you know, out with what, out with the old and in with the new almost. Yeah, in some ways, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the the fan tokens is a very interesting aspect to it, uh, because this is not uh, the same. Because it's they essentially give something to the um, the fans in the sense that they're like a membership. So as well as being a cryptocurrency, they're they're also like a membership token. Um, but the difference being, your membership is tied to uh, the token that can be exchanged or sold on later. So it gives you more than like a traditional. Uh, membership in the sense so it's not the same as gambling like within with nfts in a sense where they're much more speculative the fan tokens are a little bit more tied to the club and they're more tied to the actual fans and the, you can give discounts for example with them for merchandise or for tickets or you can give uh, access to special areas of the stadium or access to special events um, by holding this this token so it gives uh, it's quite different in that sense you know, I think I, I did, I did see that. So you're right. I think for the, you have the Barcelona fan token, then you get to vote on. I think it was something like the message on the captain's armband, or I think the Arsenal one. It was if you have an the Arsenal fan token, it allows you to choose which music is played when the team score. So I guess a fan token, it is a crypto rather than an Arsenal fan investing in Bitcoin. You should invest in an Arsenal fan token because it gets them that little bit of extra connection to to Arsenal to their club. Yeah, if, um, when yeah, we just Motor GP, engagement, yeah. yeah, Motor GP, they sort of said it's it's reinforcing that that belief and that passion that you have for the sport as a fan as well. You know, it's giving you almost a stake in in the in the fan, you know, in the in the sport. Yeah, exactly. I think it's uh, I think the fan tokens are very cool. To be honest, I think it's. Um... A really interesting way for it's if you like if you have it if you compare it to the traditional membership where okay you get you know, invited to some events or you get uh different perks but from the, the fan token point of view you, there's a lot more you can do with it there's so many so much more you can add value to that for your fans and so the theme joe uh, is of our podcast it's 21 lessons for sport and media so and if you've been really good to share a lot of insights with us but if you can say where this is going could you summarize in a in a couple of sentences for our lesson for this chat 
how what as as fans or as working in the in the industry can can learn from from these new new te technologies. Yeah, I think uh, I think we see that the blockchain technology is is uh, solid. It's something that's it's here to stay, and it's only going to grow. It's only going to continue to to be involved in more aspects of of life. And sports is one of the, the areas that it's really uh, we see it really breaking into very fast and being adopted very quickly. So I think the the takeaway is that. The, um, the fan tokens are really, really cool way to to use blockchain blockchain technology, and we're we're only going to see more of it from now on. I think. Brilliant. I think that's a per perfect perfect lesson. Actually, it's Greeks. Um, it's showing that yeah, we we can look back on on this episode in in, in five years time, maybe with our digital wallets full of full of NFTs, and this is just just just, just <laughs> the beginning. So yeah. <laughs> hey Joe, thank you very much for joining us. That's been uh, very interesting, certainly for Definitely. the likes of myself, the kind of the, the you know, I, I, more or less uninitiated. I kind of uh, found out about blockchain and cryptocurrencies in the last year or so um, just by seeing it on the news and things. And it's, it's something I'm getting more and more interested in. And then now it's exploded onto the sports scene. So uh, it's really great to have your, your wealth of experience and knowledge sharing all this with us. So thanks very much for coming on. Oh, thanks for the invite. That was good. Thanks.